Welcome to Laurier's Teaching Excellence Conversation Series. I'm Mary Wilson, Vice Provost of Teaching and Learning at Wilfrid Laurier University. And throughout this series, I'll be joined by recipients of the Donald F. Morganson Awards for Teaching Excellence to celebrate their exceptional teaching practices, learn about their teaching philosophies, and discuss the future of higher education, teaching, and learning. Today, I'm delighted to be joined by Darren Thomas from Laurier's Indigenous Studies Program, who received the 2021 Early Career Excellence Award. Darren's teaching has a transformational impact on students, and the letters of support in his nomination package describe Darren's compassion and warmth and reflect on ways in which his teaching has forever changed their lives. As an educator, Darren is fully committed to fostering the growth of the whole person, and his passionate and patient approach to teaching and mentorship have inspired his students, his colleagues, and his community alike. Darren's newest role is as Laurier's Associate Vice President of Indigenous Initiatives, where he is leading our critical and collaborative work of decolonizing and indigenizing the academy. Welcome, Darren. Thanks very much, Mary. It's certainly my honor and pleasure to be able to visit with you for a little bit today. Well, it is a real joy to talk about uh, teaching with you. Uh, I'm interested to hear about one of the key uh, components of your teaching path practice, which is around uh, storytelling in, in, your, uh, in your classroom. Can you talk about how that uh, is framed for your students, um, how they uh, adapt to that? Because I imagine it's quite different from previous educational experiences they may have had. So can you talk a little bit about how stories underpin your approach to your teaching? Well, as an Indigenous instructor, um being raised within the indigenous community storytelling is essential uh, part of our existence it's how we learn uh through our ceremony our our very identity everything is taught through story and it it just became natural for me um and a, as a young as a young man especially I just had such a thirst for wanting to know. And, and I've really, I've, I guess in some ways, um, I, I've joked and teased myself a bit and said, I've, I've always been a scientist because I've, I've always asked why, why, why? And why actually, why within indigenous community is actually rude. You're never supposed to question and ask, you know, your elders and your authority figures uh, why. But, I, you know, I, I want to know more. I want to understand more. And what I learned was the way to do that was just spend time with the old timers. So I hung out with a lot of older folks than me. I have lots of aunties, lots of uncles, lots of grandparents. Um, and, you know, learning those stories and understanding humanity just comes natural when you're spending time with our, our elders because they want to share. They want to share their stories and pass that knowledge and wisdom on. And in my life's journey, what kind of became really funny for me is as I was growing to become more, I guess, what you would call middle-aged, you know, um, people would start looking to me and asking me questions. And I said, well, don't you know that, you know, and I would go on and tell them all these things that, and they would just be astonished. And they said, well, how do you know that? And I said, doesn't everybody know that, <laughs> right? So when I came, became a professor, it was just natural for me to share that kind of learning style as well. And, and you're right, I'm sure a lot of um, non-Indigenous students um, struggle with that pedagogy because, you know, I push them for critical thinking and listening. And, you know, a lot of students do well in my courses, but you have to attend class and you have to do the reading, you know, and all the requirements that, that we ask we know a lot of students don't do the reading, but, you know, I tease, we have to have that aspect 
of that engagement. So through, unfortunately through COVID, that's what I've really missed uh, with being an instructor is connecting the humanity. I mean, it, virtual world is great, but there's a lot to the energy that you can build by sharing space together. And it, it sounds as though within your courses, you really encourage your students to be present uh, and engaged in a way that allows them to do that sort of personal interpretation of the undergirding meaning of the stories that you're using to illustrate key concepts or approaches or values or virtues within the, um, the materials that are being engaged with within a course. And do you, do you model it for them? Do you overtly talk to them about how to learn effectively in that kind of deeply engaged and interactive space? Um, what do you find is most effective for framing that if they're unfamiliar with that? I ask them to be patient, you know, and um, that it will be a, an adjustment. And, and I, I I state that right away that I'm unlike a lot of their other professors um, and many of the indigenous professors we have use an indigenous pedagogy in, in their classes. And I also hear that, you know, from colleagues that students struggle with them as well, you know, but it, it's, it does take a little different approach to being able to engage on, on the level I'm asking students to do. Because, you know, and although I provide PowerPoints and, you know, do all the normal standard practices, my PowerPoints for my lectures are a very, very loose, rough outline. And so you'll learn some by just reviewing the PowerPoints, but you're not going to get the impact of the story that explains the concepts. And because I've done a lot of different things within my life and career, um, I have stories for everything, stories for everything and, and about my travels and my work in, in different areas of, of the world. And um, so I think it's that, though those students that are patient with me and the Indigenous students that are coming on board and, and attending class, they, they love attending class because for them, like it, it's a real rich opportunity to just spend time together in which normally, again, if we remove the university walls would be like we're sitting having some tea somewhere and just visiting and having a talk about something. I think that idea of asking them to be patient and develop trust in that storytelling and circle pedagogy, that conversational engagement with, I think, sometimes very difficult subject matter and self-examination of assumptions, of history, of how we situate ourselves relative to deep socio-political injustice that's been long-standing and continues to permeate uh, so much of our lives, that that can be, I think, quite unsettling for some students, but you clearly do it within an environment that has created a sense of safety uh, for the students. Um, if you were to advise colleagues uh, who are beginning to teach using these kinds of methodologies about what you found to be effective for creating that sense of safety within a classroom environment so that students are able to grapple with those very difficult ideas that actually lead to some change and some reframing of, of assumptions and open them up for, for additional learning. What would you advise? What would you suggest? Well, there, there's two very different approaches um, that are complementary to, to what I do in the classroom, especially around um, my intro class to Indigenous studies, because one of the things that I've had to do, and, and, and now I, al I also have to set this up a little bit. So uh, I've been doing 
outside of the university, I've been working in a public sector for years, working with justice and healthcare, child welfare, education, um, because as, as we've evolved to this place today that's looking at reconciliation and looking to try to uh, restore relations between Indigenous and non-Indigenous people, we have all these pu public sector institutions that are tasked to meet the calls to action of, of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. And, and even municipalities have done work with cities and, and town councils as well that, that are struggling with the same question about how do we advance and improve uh, relations. And what we struggle with is this huge gap in knowledge because we're all tasked with trying to repair and restore relations. But the reality is, unfortunately, many of us in Canada don't know what we're even reconciling. We don't even understand the history. We don't understand the frustration and the anger. But what we do see certainly is civil disobedience. We see the protests and we hear about the horrific uh, health conditions that Indigenous people are, are having to uh, live with. Um, and, and then we sprinkle that with many, many, many prejudicial assumptions about Indigenous people get everything for free and they're in jail and they're lazy, they don't want to work and go on and on and on. So what I find myself doing in teaching my introductory Indigenous studies courses is it's as much about unlearning as it is about learning. And what I challenge students with, and even when I work in the public sector, the participants in my training, to again, set all that stuff to the side, what they think they know and understand about indigenous people. And to hear an indigenous perspective, to pay attention to a critical examination of Canada and the settlement history of Canada and how that has impacted the lives of Indigenous people. And I think when people can set their, their assumptions aside, they're able to find a place of empathy. Because I think right now that's what's missing within Canadian society is many folks don't have empathy for Indigenous peoples and their situations. And, you know, we're, we're blaming them for the resulting living conditions that were created for them, that they had no power to control, that they had no ability to actually impact. And that's some of the work that I do in my senior courses is looking at those deeper discussions. So with our social work students, our youth and children students, uh, our uh, students in Indigenous law and globalization, we start looking at global impacts and law and legislation, social policy, and seeing how all these things have been created that still control the circumstances of Indigenous people's lives. And that if we're truly talking about reconciliation, the important part of our learning is to become skilled in understanding that history but also knowing how we can impact the future. And so what I'm seeing out there in community, in, in the public sector, is a lot of organizations and municipalities want to do the right thing, but they don't know what to do. Um, and a lot of our learners are developing such compassion themselves and empathy for wanting to make a difference in this world. So. In my new role, that's really what's sparking my interest in wanting to do this new role is, is to stretch that beyond just Indigenous studies now and beyond Brantford and looking at Laurier as a whole and our institutional commitment for Indigenization, decolonization, and reconciliation and to find the ways in which we can accomplish that. 
What you're talking about, Darren, strikes me as being one of the more powerful components of teaching practice or orientation to teaching practice that would be a broader benefit uh, to all of us as educators. So because I think our orientation to practice uh, tends to be that we're working toward building knowledge within our students, assuming uh, that there's nothing to dismantle uh, to begin with. And, and there's a great deal of work to do uh, to help students to question, to problematize, to interrogate knowledge sources, to examine their assumptions, uh, to think about the consequences of those assumptions and how they're tied to beliefs, actions, um, value systems. Uh, and that could, I think, be so powerful for setting our students up for a broader orientation to critical thinking and research practice um, and, and just, as you say, empathy. And empathy is so critical to our role as good community members, good citizens, and certainly one of the aims that we have of, of learning and growing together as nations. Uh, so I think that, that that insight into your activity in the classroom, uh, particularly with entering students, you know, often with, when we have our students in our first semester in our intro courses, we're uh, spending a lot of time trying to help them to understand the, the uh, territory of knowledge in the discipline. And here we're endeavoring to question, unpack, uh, the, those assumptions that have been inherent in our structures, in our system, in their education, uh, and permeate so many aspects of our culture and our history that sometimes they, we, we don't even recognize them uh, and how they're in action. Uh, so that, that critical thinking capacity that you are priming them for, you've got to see that cast forward in their capacities as students in, in higher level courses. Uh, can you reflect a little bit on, on what you see when you're teaching more senior level students? As I was preparing my application for tenure um, and I was reviewing all my uh, course evals and, and I was sharing it with my family, right? And they were, they were getting sick of all of the, the qualitative comments. And, and they said, you, you know, they teased me and said, you have a fan club, right? And I've had students follow me and take course after course. And, and I've had a lot of students who acquired their minor or double major uh, by, by taking many of the courses that I teach. And I've even had several students um, go on to graduate school and sharing it was because of the work that I did with them in their senior grades, in, in their senior courses to, to push them to think differently and to give them the skills that they would need um, out there in the world, whether it's in further academic uh, study or out in the public sector somewhere. So it, it's been a very rewarding experience. And I'm not gonna lie, a lot of it's been challenging as well, you know, especially for the first years. I think, because um, one, one of the other things I, I need to talk about too is I, I don't use rubrics. I'm, I'm a real critic of rubrics because um, I find when I've used rubrics, students will try to write to the rubric just to try to get the score, right? And I'll provide them a grading scheme and said, this is what I expect. This is, you know, so especially in first year, you know, we have a critical reflection uh, assignment in my first year course. And we're lucky here in Brantford because we're in close proximity to the former Indian residential school. So, uh, when we were in person, we would actually go physically to the site and we would hear from a former student and they would tour the grounds of this uh, uh, former Indian residential school. So that in itself, just as a trip, is transformational. But then to push them to think critically about that experience. And, and I think that's 
of of all the moments in in my teaching that assignment alone sees the most significant transformation of these students because it makes them really those who again fully engage in the process fully see and experience the history of canada the history of social policy the planned extinction and termination of indigenous people and they're they're witness to it by hearing from a former student that had been brutalized in these schools and often many students will reflect about their own family's experiences and trauma their own experiences of maybe of traveling to germany and and seeing the 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 concentration camps um and and so they start drawing parallels to evil and trauma throughout the world and their own lived experience but then the explosion of empathy and compassion that comes for them for indigenous people and understanding this is why they're fighting this is why they're resisting this is why they're continuing to ask for their rights um, because of this violence that's been perpetrated upon them so that alone you know has propelled students to really engage in indigenous studies um, and and when the aspect of that too in that course is we don't spend that duration just looking at trauma. We look at the beauty of indigeneity and we look at what life was like prior to contact and how we had laws and civilizations and governance and the culture is so beautiful. And many students just absolutely fall in love with that part of it, the, the culture. And it's so simple to be grateful, to be kind, to be loving, uh, to support one another, to lift each other up when, when we're down. And um, people just, uh, you know, the students who, who've learned that just absolutely fall in love with that culture because it's, it's such a different way of understanding the world that they've been exposed and that they hadn't been exposed to until they took Indigenous studies. So it's a very humanized uh, pedagogy that interacts with the individuals rather than with that level of remove that's focused predominantly on documentation, uh, which I, I think must also really draw upon your skills as a mentor and a coach and somebody who clearly helps your students to understand that you're invested in them personally, that you care about their progress, that you, you know, you, you are uh, there to help them think through the very difficult components of that work, rather than being sort of at a level of remove. Um, that's, uh, that's a, a degree of emotional labor um, that is both rewarding and sometimes frightening and sometimes very taxing. So how, how do you balance that, Darren? Um, as, as educators, we often carry with us the, the troubles, the traumas of our students uh, and that great sense of burden and duty we have to help them with all of their growth and development uh, as they engage with difficult course concepts and they come to know us as guides. Um, have you got some, some things that you've learned that help you to... Uh, to keep perspective and and stay open and available for the students and and yet not exhaust yourself yeah um i i have to be very open and and transparent with the students and tell them that um there's times when i can get through their so again imagine reading a hundred papers of trauma right and again I have my own lived experience of trauma. That in itself, just grading is triggering, hearing story after story after story. So there's times when, you know, again, I can get through several papers and one sit down and marking. And there's some times where I'm only going to mark one paper that day because I just can't. 
right? So I have to uh, share with the students that they have to be patient in that aspect as well, that I'm not going to return things as much as they would like, because of course, students, they all want to know instantly what they've done and how they've done in, in their coursework. But, um, you know, and, and I, I explain to them why, why it takes me some time to get through that in my own history. And, and so I share a lot of my own personal journey and my own personal story of, of um, and, and again, I'm, I'm actually four generations removed from Indian residential school, but that doesn't mean that that trauma still isn't there. That violence was still perpetrated through my family because it was a learned behavior that passed on, you know, um, and my, uh, my grandparents, where it actually came from, from was my grandmother was from the United States and she went to uh, Carlisle. Well, her parents went to Carlisle Indian Residential School, which was one of the worst ones in Carlisle, Pennsylvania. So it was, um, it was in my extended family, but that again, is understanding how that trauma works and continues to perpetrate through the generations. So by sharing that, um, students uh, have been really patient with me and, and they know that, you know, they're not going to get everything back next week when they, <laughs> when they get it, you know, because it, it just takes time to go through that. I think one of the valuable things for the students, though, is to explain the rationale um, behind the um, the change in those expected conventions within a classroom and the value of it um, so that they understand the choices that you've made as an educator and what the intended benefit is for students. I think often we, um, we take for granted how much our students benefit from understanding the reasoning behind our course and curriculum design and the decisions we make about what kinds of activities we engage them in and what order and how, how we go about um, setting up the, uh, the assessment opportunities for their learning and how we provide feedback and what we intend for them to do with that feedback. So you've, uh, you know, you, you've won for early career excellence, Darren, and I can understand why, because you have this intimate understanding of your own teaching practice. Uh, and and are very deliberate and thoughtful in your approaches. Um, I, th I think that's gonna really resonate with a lot of early career educators who need to understand um, why they approach their teaching practice the way that they do, how they go about making decisions in their, in their pedagogy. And I think just that insight alone is, is really brilliant and valuable. Um, and now I really wanna ask you about when you look ahead to the future of uh, teaching and learning, the future of work, uh, what do you think uh, we will be working toward soon? Like particularly around the future of teaching practice at Laurier. Uh, if you have hopes or aspirations, or if you, if you see the start uh, of something that you really recognize as being valuable for us. Well, I, I think with, uh, we've all been forced into the virtual realm. And so innovative teaching practices have been forced upon us, like it or not. Um, and, you know, I I'm certainly miss the uh, interactions with, with students uh, sharing the space, but have also learned about some of the innovation within some of the tools and the various platforms that you can use uh, and the engagement and, and you can bring in other resources where you always don't have to be the, the defined expert in sharing that knowledge uh, to students as well. So in some ways, uh, I think it's, you know, uh, made it easier in, in terms of transferring that knowledge, but tougher in looking at how do you transfer that knowledge? So I think there's still, we're, we're still gonna go through some growing pains, I think in, in the short years to come. Uh, 
because some have fallen in love with the virtual learning environment. Some absolutely hate it. Um, and that's for faculty and for students to, to discover what they're good at. And, um, and I think that, you know, we're, we're going to continue to grow. Uh, the one great thing about the virtual world for Indigenous studies um, is it made it more accessible across the university. Instead of just teaching students in Brantford, I had students, you know, that were in majors in Waterloo and wanting to take courses. And um, so it created a real thirst across the entire Laurier community to, to get more of that knowledge. And so it's allowed us to expand into uh, other areas where we haven't been. Um, but for me, in, in my role, now as a senior leader, I, I struggle with wanting to even um, take this role because I love teaching so much and I love the students so much. And, you know, maybe in a year or two, I might still pick up a course, you know, here and there once I get settled into this appointment. Um, but what my family assured me of is that I'm still gonna have the opportunity to teach, but now my classroom, is the entire Laurier University and working um, beyond Laurier and all our community partners and, and, you know, working on a much larger vision for where we can go at Laurier. And that part of my role as a senior lead is sharing that vision and still having that opportunity to teach and demonstrate, you know, some learning and empathy and, um, across uh, the entire university. Yes, I would absolutely agree that you have a much expanded network of students now, Darren. Uh, but I, uh, I also uh, feel that call to return to the classroom. It's always such a privilege uh, to share classroom space, whether it's virtual or in person with students. Uh, and I really appreciate your commentary as well, that invitation to pause and reflect on uh, what we can take forward from the last 18 months um, of the pandemic, uh, because it's been quite a headlong rush. And there are components of it that will uh, encourage us to revisit some of our um, uh, class uh, design plans, our uh, assignments, our content, our interactions with students, the benefits and the drawbacks for our students and for us as educators. And I think we really do need to take the time to read and frame and reflect and have conversations with colleagues uh, so that we can make really deliberate choices going to the future about what parts we adopt and continue to build on. And, and I think that's you know one of the great joys of, of being a teacher is that invitation that's always there to, uh, to continue to learn and expand our practice. I think as a community, we have a lot to learn around um, circle pedagogy, storytelling as an approach, your, your um, insights into mentorship and coaching, into assessment practices. So I'm absolutely delighted to have had this uh, conversation today and really want to thank you uh, for joining uh, me and to thank the audience as well uh, for joining us as we celebrate teaching excellence and student success. I hope you'll join me again for the next conversation as I continue to celebrate our award recipients and highlight exceptional teaching and teachers at Laurier. Thank you.